Hi everyone and welcome or welcome back to Venus Beaches. So today we're talking about the poem Out of the Bag by She Mosheni. This is another poem on the Edexcel A-level English literature curriculum and without much further ado this is quite a long one and quite a lot to say so let's get started. <laughs> The phrase letting the cat out of the bag means telling a secret, unintentionally usually. Oh, I, oops, I've let the cat out of the bag. And the title is a reference to this and it's also a play on words because it is quite literally out of the bag in this case. It's about the secret being let out and about the speaker finding out how babies are born. So yes, in that way it is letting the cat out of the bag, but also the speaker thinks that babies come out of the bag, so it is also quite literally out of the bag. As the poem progresses, the speaker finds out that babies don't actually come from Dr. Carlin's bag, but the poem starts with the with the phrase, all of us came in Dr. Carlin's bag. This refers to the speaker and to the siblings. And so there's a sense of duality in the poem, a sense of a secret being revealed. And the secret is not only really about realizing how children are born, but about realizing that your family was not really like the rest and that your childhood was not this perfect ideal thing that it seemed. His family was poor, but he didn't see that as a child. For him, his family was always the best and and it's only growing up now that he's seeing that he didn't really have the ideal picture-perfect childhood that he thought he did. And it's not a bad thing, it's just about aging and growing up and about acquiring an awareness about where one came from. The poem explores themes of identity, family, and society, and it could be compared to the furthest distances I've traveled, genetics, and effects. The poem's structure is quite cyclical, which shows that the ending can have just as much impact as the beginning and vice versa, because it is a poem where the theme of time is a key theme, so by its cyclical nature it alludes to that too, that time is not so linear as the speaker finds out. The poem is not really four separate poems, but rather it's four sections within a single poem. It explores the relationship between the past and the present, the change of time, the different types of healing and growing up and coming of age and understanding things that you haven't understood before and rediscovering your childhood through another prism, through not the eyes of you as a child, but through the eyes of you as an adult. And it's significant that there are four parts here. The number four signifies death in a lot of cultures. And also, interestingly, but this might be a stretch too far, but just in case, since the exam board does want you to know alternate interpretations, it could be a reference to Ireland. The symbol of Ireland is a clover and like a four-leaf clover is famously a sign of good luck, so perhaps it could be a reference to that too. And so the number four means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. To the author, it could be a symbol of luck, much like the four-leaf clover. But I think he's also very aware that the number four has symbolism of death in other cultures. But it could be a reference to him realizing just how lucky he was to have a mother that loved him so and treated him so, even if they didn't have this ideal of picture-perfect childhood that he hoped they did. In the first two sections, the structure is not regular. It's not in regular triplets. But in the last two sections, they are in regular triplets because he begins to make sense of the poem and piece it together for himself. Just like this confusion, this haze of childhood is starting to fade away and give way to awareness. There's a lot of free verse as he makes these associations and learns and it just goes to show that you don't always have to impose an order onto things. Sometimes just letting things run their course and really allowing them the freedom, allowing you the freedom to learn at your own pace without forcing it to go at a certain pace or to go in a certain direction can be just as enlightening in terms of bringing awareness. He doesn't limit his recollections to ancient Greece, Greeks or to farm work. He lets his mind take wherever the mind wants to wander and it is ultimately this that leads him to the process that leads him through the process of discovery to the point of understanding something about himself. A little bit about Shimus Hini. So he's actually considered an intellectual. He's in between acad academia, he has an academic brain, but he also uses a lot of onomatopoeia and his poems about his poems are often about the personal and the raw. So he's called the po the poet in between. From Northern Ireland, which is also significant because Northern Ireland has a complicated history, the UK tried to impose Protestantism, while the rest of Ireland is largely Roman Catholic, and so there was an unofficial civil war between people had different 
because people had different beliefs and different ideas. So he, when he writes about the land as well, there is also the status of an in-betweenness. And this unofficial civil war really only ended in the 1990s, but Britain's interference really prolonged the issue. And because he, it, like because of Shimus's background, people kind of expected him to take a Roman Catholic stance, something he didn't do, and he eventually moved from Northern Ireland because he said that he felt pressured. So that's just a little bit of context as to why Shimus Heaney is called the poet in between. All of us came in Dr. Carlin's bag. He'd arrived with it, disappeared to the room, and by the time he'd reappeared to wash those nosy, rosy, big, soft hands of his in this colory basin, its lined insides, the color of a spaniel's inside lug. There's a childlike meditation on their origins from the speaker. The doctor appears like a magician, like a godlike figure. He appears and then he disappears. This is how the speaker imagines him once he's been told that they all came in his bag. Of course, he's like a godlike figure. This is the person that brought them to life out of this bag. The description of his hands it's, is very important. They're called nosy, rosy, big, soft. The use of assonance, the use of rhyme, it brings to mind this image of a starstruck child staring in awe at this doctor, at this godlike figure with his amazing hands. The child notices every detail about him because he thinks this is the maker. This is the person who made me who I am. And of course, at that age, children are really interested in exploring their identities and figure, figuring out who they are. So this is why that doctor is so, so, so important for him. When the doctor comes to deliver the children, he washes his hands in the scullery basin. So a scullery basin is sort of like a kitchen area traditionally used for washing up dishes. And lug is a Northern Irish term for the inside of the dog's ear. So inside the sink, the color of the inside of a spaniel's lug, the color of a spaniel's ear. It's a very vivid description. and it shows how this experience was very important for the speaker as a child and of course also i think that if if you're anything like the majority of the people or you were in your childhood you wanted a dog or you wanted a childhood pet if you didn't have one so i think this in particular he's washing his hands in this colory basin so it's almost like the basin reminds him of his desire to have a pet so again something that links to childhood a childhood memory, perhaps for many, were empty for all to see. The trap sprung mouth and snibbed and gaping wide. Then, like a hypnotist in winding us, he'd wind the instruments back into their lining, tie the cloth like an apron round itself, darken the door, and leave. The insides of the sink were observed by everyone, just like the doctor's bag. This, just like the dog is like this forbidden pet that you want but that you can't have, so too are the doctor's hands. It's hard for this child to imagine, wow, these are the hands that brought me to life. And he's almost scared to approach the doctor, to approach this person who is so great in his eyes. Unsnipped means unlocked. So there used to be a lock on the doctor's bag in olden times, sort of like this thing that you had to kind of do this to open. His bag was this gaping wide hole that they would look in, that they would feel like they're staring into an abyss, whereas of course they're only looking into the doctor's bag. But the doctor is this this figure that's so distant in his greatness, in his status as the person who not only brought them to life, but as an educated person, as an older person. And so it's like this bag represents an impossibility, something that they can never understand because they're all too shy and too self-conscious to look inside and to really ask the doctor these questions. Perhaps the doctor isn't even aware that his that their mom has told them the story that, oh, you came from the bag. And like a hypnotist. So the smile reinforces the idea of the doctor's trickery and them seeing the doctor as someone magic, as someone who hypnotizes because they don't really understand how it happened that they came from his bag or how he did what he did. The doctor is seen as this omnipotent puppet master who somehow unwinds them. There's a contrast between the babies and the instruments showing that the children believe they all came to from the bag and so did the instruments, so they're in a way related to them. Then he'd leave, with the bag in his hand, a plump arc by the keel. And so the next time came, and in he'd come, in his fur-lined collar that was also spaniel-colored. So Ark is a reference to Noah's Ark. The Ark is the boat and the bottom bit of the boat is the keel. Ark by the keel. So the Ark is plump. So in a way the bag is like in like an Ark shape like this because there's a lot of things inside and it's chunky and the bottom is kind of 
press it pressing down to make it this arc shaped but of course for the religious upbringing of the children who already think that they came from the bag and this is their origin all they think about are biblical stories like noah and his animals just like noah saved the life of the animals so too the doctor has brought them to life and the doctor's visits would come quite often again showing that the speaker has a lot of siblings and it's also usually something that happens in more lower income families that there are more children due to less preventative measures and less contraception but also sometimes due to the culture families prefer bigger families clo close-knit communities so this again is like a little hint of the speaker's background and just like the image of the sink is the color of the fur lined collar that the doctor has this shows the importance of the doctor for the child, how he's so intertwined with their daily lives that he's the same sink as their scullery kitchen. So he's almost connected with their home because he's connected with their upbringing. He's almost a part of their family. And fur-lined collar, it also shows the disparity and the class gap between the doctor and the speaker and his family because the doctor would have, again, been a well-educated, a well-earning man, whereas the speaker's family, as he discovers, is not exactly like that and it also for him it's so impressive that he has a fur lined collar that this this man this rich and well-educated person has delivered me someone who has never touched a fur collar before and goes stooping up to the room again a whiff of disinfectant a dutch interior gleam of waistcoat satin and highlights on the forceps the doctor's wearing a satin waistcoat and the shine reminds him of the famous Dutch paintings, Rembrandt perhaps, etc. There's a smell that hits the speaker, the smell of disinfectant. It's saying that the doctor is like an artist in his craft, a Dutch interior gleam, but a whiff of disinfectant. It's almost like the elements that make up a painting, but of course... It's in a different category, but he views him with the same admiration that one would view, for example, Rembrandt. And it's again accentuating the gap between and the gap in wealth between the between the speaker's family and that of the doctor. The divide in knowledge with reference to the Greeks and Heaney's humble origins. So specifically, like Dutch interior gleam and this whiff of disinfectant of waistcoat satin of highlights on the forceps. It's this vocabulary that we have associated with a certain quality of life, like satin or a Dutch interior gleam. And it's, it's again conveying this area of mystery that the doctor has surrounding him. Getting the water ready, that was next. Not plumping hot and not lukewarm, but soft, said luscious, saved for him from the rain butt. Getting the water ready. Coma. That was next. So the seizure here, that was next. It shows that it's becoming like a familiar process, a familiar step because they have seen the doctor so many times. And we have a neologism here, a made up word. We have a word made out of two words, sud and luscious. Sud dash luscious here. So sud is like a bubble and luscious is sort of like appealing strongly to the senses, something aesthetically beautiful. And a rain butt is kind of like this outdoor cylinder where you can collect water. It's especially popular in villages and like places outside the city because the, it's considered that the rain water is like the cleanest form of water so it doesn't have to be filtrated you can just collect it straight from the sky and it's saved for him it's this idea of the, the purest water that you can find that's heated for the delivery and of course we understand as the reader that it's because it's needed for the birth but for the speaker it just seems wow i mean it's suitable that it's the purest water for this godlike figure who has delivered me and there's also this idea of pure purity and specifically Christian purity, the idea of saving the best for God because of course he views him as a god. And the sensory imagery here and the use of sibilance really adds to the dreamlike quality of the poem and savored by him afterwards, all thanks, denied as he toweled hard and fast, then held his arms out suddenly behind him to be squired and silk lined into the camel coat, at which point he once turned his eyes upon me, hyperborean, beyond the north wind blew. After the delivery, they would thank the doctor, rush around him, say, oh, thank you, but he would merely towel the baby, 
all thanks denied as he held it. So very calmly he would say, oh, it's no trouble at all and simply do his job and then suddenly finish the delivery and hold his arms out to be squired, to be fitted into the coat, to hold them out behind him like this, to have someone put on this coat on him. That he views this job as just another job, that it's something average, that it's something normal, something that for them is also admirable because a delivery is a difficult job, but for the doctor it's like a part of his life that he views as, oh, oh, well, this is nothing, whereas for them it's this miraculous process of delivering a life. And camel color. So squired, the doctor is a very special person. This is a sign of respect, a sign of serving, that they're, that, that they're really treating him like a king, that they're putting on the coat on him. A squire would be a lord, so he's treated like a lord, and he's done this great favor to them, because we can probably guess that they didn't really pay a lot of money for this, that he took cheaper, understanding that their origins are a lot more humble than, for example, the doctor's origins, so they would be very grateful. And, of course, camel, an animal that the speaker would have never seen, that he would never have traveled, but that he would have probably read about in books. So he's seeing this doctor in this, what he imagines is a camel color, a coat of, like, exotic color, a coat of a distant origin, and Hyperborean. So in mythology, that's a godlike perfect figure, an inspiration to the young Seamus Heaney. There's a difference in social status again as demonstrated here and as emphasized by the use of the word hyperborean and the eyes are seen as windows to the soul so having his eyes being described as hyperborean beyond the north wind blue they're perfect they they're like the northern wind it shows how the peepholes to the locked room are the doctor's eyes. It's like this gateway to medicine, and that's why they're so perfect. They're beyond northern wind blue. They're a whole special shade of blue. Two peepholes to the locked room I saw into. Every time his name was mentioned, skimmed, milk and eyes, swapped porcelain, the white and chill of tiles, steel hooks, chrome surgery tools, and blood drips and the sawdust where it's thickened at the foot of each cold wall and overhead. So here there's an ominous semantic field. It gives terrifying imagery, something reminiscent of a horror film, because we don't really quite understand what the speaker is referring to. Well, just like he didn't really. His childlike imagination paints a scary and terrifying figure. This doctor in this white coat with this great godlike figure, but he's also dealing with all these strange things that he doesn't understand, and so his imagination fills in the gaps. All he has are these tiny little peepholes, the hidden delivery room. He sees this horrifying imagery, this hospital, this what calls to mind hospital imagery, really. The chill of tiles, the steel hooks. Sawdust also highlights how poor they were, so it was used to wipe up blood and for heat, so it shows that delivery is not really taking place in the most sanitary of conditions. And chromium, so it's about the smooth appearance and the shine. So these chrome surgery tools, something that don't doesn't really seem to belong amongst this background. And they don't have something to clean the dirt, so it's not very unhygienic, and that's important because we later talk about hygiene. So this is, there's a bit of foreshadowing here. This links to the future of the poem, and for this for the child, we see that although these visits are inspiring, they're also surrounded by an area of misunderstanding that causes him to feel scared because the blood drips in the sawdust and thickens at the foot of the cold wall, and there's a chill of ice and there's swabbed porcelain, and there's just a general fear, much like many people still fear medicine to this day, and surgery and operation, because we don't really understand it as not doctors, or we don't really feel like we can truly control what happens. We're dependent on the doctor, and likewise he feels, wow, there's this godlike figure who I came from, but I'm, I'm dependent on his grace for my survival, even though he's already here. The little pendant, teat-hued infant parts strung neatly from a line up near the ceiling. A toe, a foot, and shin, an arm, a cock. So pendant means hanging, and teat-hued, so it's the color of nipples, a bit about the woman's breast, and at first the baby bits are separate for him, so, and at this point we as the reader are just like, oh my god, there's baby parts hanging on the wall, uh, so the epiphany for him is that the parts are actually joined, so he begins to understand that these things are all connected. It's linguistically interesting to see here the different meanings of the word incubated, and yeah, he's imagining that all the parts are hanging from the ceiling and all the toes and 
foot and shin and an arm is they're all hanging here from the ceiling but then suddenly the doctor pulls them together to make a baby and gives the baby to their mother a bit like the rosebud in his buttonhole but then we go from the topic of physical doctors to mental and spiritual doctors to the doctors of poetry and we talk about the speaker's visit to spiritual places so as a kid he visited them and now with an adult uh, now as an adult with the passage of time he really realizes the importance of the growth the second part uses a lot of complicated and polysyllabic vocabulary and really elevated language and it has a dreamlike quality as the speaker reflects on his childhood and on the past and on what he viewed the doctor as, as a sublime being. Poet Adoctus Peter Levy says, sanctuaries of Asclepius, called Asclepions, were the equivalent of hospitals. So Poet Adoctus is the educated poet, a learned poet. He says that the educated Peter Levy Peter Levy, or Peter Levi, I'm not sure, has made a comparison between the sanctuaries of Asclepius and hospitals. It's like the theme of healing and of doctors carried over in this part from the first one as the topic shifts to mental health. It's about how, it's about this idea of having an educated mind will keep you healthy. That health is more than just about the body, it's about the mind. And it's a, if you're smart and if you're well educated, then you're more likely to stay healthy too. There used to be special places like hospitals for the mind, which would keep you mentally active, and it's places like Lourdes, like what he's visiting now. In ancient Greece, or of shrines like Lourdes, says poet Adoptus Gravis, or of, of the cure by poetry that cannot be coerced. So yeah, Lourdes was a place for healing where people go for praying and to drink holy water and it's a reference to Robert Graves, also a scholar of classics and Latin and Greek and he thought that places like Epidaurus or Lourdes were also hospitals. They cure The cure by poetry cannot be coerced. So meaning that poetry can help you find meaning but poetry cannot be forced onto people if they don't really understand if they don't really believe it's not something that you can force them like you can't say oh you have to read all these poems and then you'll be cured it's something that has to be there naturally it cannot be coerced and it was believed in the past that poetry can actually find uh, help you find god and that poets and artists especially in the romanticism period that they served as a, like the link between us the lay person and god because they would talk in these higher forms or produce these higher forms of arts and of culture. He then talks about his own visit to Epidaurus and considering the religious nature of this, it's quite significant. Say I, who realized at Epidaurus that the whole place was a sanatorium with theater and gymnasium and baths, a site of incubation where incubation was technical and ritual, meaning sleep, when epiphany occurred and you met the god. So he didn't believe this, but now that he visited Epidaurus, he realized just how much the whole thing was like a gym for your mental health. So the theater was the spirit and mental health, gymnasium was for physical health, the bath was for cleanliness. So cleanliness of the mind, body, and soul, the key elements to a happy life. To incubate, meaning to help raise the child, especially that has been born early, it's like a sort of plastic box where children are kept at a warm temperature. And likewise here, it's like an incubation, uh, te a technical and ritual site. So you're allowed to develop and grow as a person in a special ritual where you're waiting for your spiritual healing, for your chance to meet God, to have an epiphany occur. Heatless grogy, shadowing myself as the thoroughfare I was in an open air procession in lords in 56. So Thurifer references a Roman Catholic service where he was shaking an infused container and he was feeling rogy, so his head was reeling, uh, likely because he it was really hot and shadowing myself hatless. He didn't have a hat, so he wasn't protected against the elements. He's exposed to the heat. It's ironic here that the place he's gone to for healing, he feels worse. And also notice the sounds here, Thurifer Groggy. I mean, I barely got it out when I was saying it because references the kind of confusion he feels at the stage because imagine it's just a really hot day, you're without a hat, you're borderline sunstroke, and you're smoking all this 
incense and it's this assault to the senses and then that's actually what leads him to his own meeting with god so he feels worse and then he feels better in a way in 1956 he was visiting lords and then he had an epiphany when i nearly fainted from the heat and fumes again i nearly fainted as i bent to pull a bunch of grass and hallucinate it so yeah like i said i mean hot air and smells is just a combination for fainting but when he bends down to reach for more grass to take part in the ceremony he's determined to take part in that's when he has a hallucination so he sees the doctor the doctor is his meeting with god again showing that he hasn't really let this part of his childhood go this view that the doctor is like a god because he brought him to life he sees the doctor the educated poet and he sees him drawing and he's entertaining the child and the drawing is made out of steam and so it begins to drip and to droop and as the water runs again he sees the different baby bits a sort of a, a, a whirl under his hand and the use of the water as an image in these next stanzas that i'm about to read it's also important as water can be a symbol for life so dr curlin at the steamed up glass of our scullery window starting in to draw with his large pink index finger dot-faced men with button spots in a straight line down their fronts and women with dot breasts giving them all a set of droopy sausage arms and legs that soon began to run and then as he dipped and laved in the generous suds again miraculum the baby bits all came together swimming into his soapy big hygienic hands and i myself came too blinded with sweat blinking and shaky in the windless light so there's a, quite a few enjambments here which is why i actually kind of went over this together in one bit before because the doctor is drawing images and the enjambments allow the poem to move along like water like the images that the doctor is drawing they're flowing and so now we realize that actually those like hanging baby parts was a reference to this that the doctor is standing in front of like in front of a window that's fogged up or a mirror where you can draw like, oh in front of a glass surface basically and he's drawing for the child he's entertaining the child and the child is seeing all these droopy people start to drip onto each other and i don't know like it just feels like a childlike activity and it has warm associations but at the same time it is a little bit creepy and it is a little bit sad and it is a little bit terrifying and i suppose it's exactly this mix of emotions that the child felt and the, the speaker as a child felt about his own birth kind of misunderstanding confusion but at the same time fascination and entertainment the doctor drew the stick figures for the child with his big hygienic hands so the word hygienic actually comes from hygia the personification of hygiene cleanliness one of the daughters of Asclepius, the very same Asclepius we talked about before, and this prepares us for the next section, where the speaker begins to come back to reality. So as a, spe as a child, he found the doctor miraculous, just like the poet the doctors, the educated doctor who treats with poetry, so it's a different kind of doctor. And when the speaker comes back to life, he's blinded by the light, and he's sweaty, and he's shaky, and in classical imagery, wind was associated with creativity and we talked about before how it's like more than the north wind hyperborean so he was out of ideas of what to do with himself and with his art now as an adult person but it was this visit to lords that he undertook because he didn't know what to do with himself creatively that prompted this like experience that reminded him of the higher forces and inspiration so it was reconnecting with his childhood that helped him unlock his future sort of like healing your inner child to become your best adult bits of the grass i pulled i posted off to one going into chemotherapy and one who had come through i didn't want to leave the place or link up with the others it was midday mid-may pre-tourist sunlight in the precincts of the god the very sight of the temple of asclepius i wanted nothing more than to lie down under hogweed under seeded grass and to be visited in the very eye of the day by hygieia his daughter her name still clarifying the haven of light she was the undarkening door bits of the grass that he picked up during the ritual when he was burning incense he sent to someone going through chemotherapy so he's sending the grass to someone who has cancer because it is believed that it is that because this is a holy place people believe that if you bring water or grass or i mean anything from that place it's like bringing healing into someone's life so that is why he's taking it for his friend and another friend who just went to therapy because this is a place of healing and he's remembering his friends because he's hoping that just like this experience has been healing for him 
that this experience will be healing for his friends perhaps through him. He realizes that he doesn't want to leave this place. He doesn't want to come back. I mean, it's a sanctuary. It's a place where you can in where you can incubate, he says, where you can grow as a person. And so of course he doesn't want to leave because after you've had an experience like this to go back into normal life, to leave this comfort and self-reflection, is painful. He just wants to lie here and to be visited by Hygieia and to really be visited and struck by inspiration once more and just stay here in calm and tranquility. But the reference to Hygieia and sanitation could also be amusing on how, although poetry can be healing, it's not necessarily always the solution to real life problems, <laughs> the undarkening door. So if you want to tell someone that you don't want to see them again, you can tell them, never darken my doorstep again. The idea is that you cast a shadow on someone's door, but Hygieia is so light, so pure. She doesn't cast a shadow on the door. She brings light instead. The door acts as a shift from the masculine ideal of the doctor, of this godlike figure, to the feminine ideal of Asclepius' daughter, to the speaker's adulthood feminine ideal. Rather than the ominous and dark doors that he, that he associated with the doctor, he's now seeing the healing door that Hygieia brings, a hygienic and clean and understandable environment. Because now he has all this context for his childhood memories and once he's understood them, he ceases to be terrified of them and instead sees them for what they are, an experience that has brought him here. The room I came from and the rest of us all came from stays pure reality where I stand alone, standing the passage of time and she's asleep and sheets put on for the doctor, wedding presents that showed up again and again, bridal and usual and useful at birth and death. So the bit about the door is picked up here with the room I came from. In a way, the third part is a doorway into the fourth part, so it's a very smooth transition. His spiritual healing is the doorway to embracing new memories and to embracing the present rather than being stuck in the past or dreaming about the future. Here, he's healing and rediscovering things that he hasn't had, but now he's back in the present, in the room, but this time to watch his mother die. It's to have the cycle start over. It's a progression of time and of life as he watches his mother die and now that room stands that passage of time. So isn't it crazy how quickly time goes by? How before that room for him was associated with his birth and now for the adult self it's associated with his mother's death. She's asleep, that brings ambiguity. And sleeping brings back the idea of also liminality, of being on the border of life and of death and of consciousness and unconsciousness. And the sheets that his mother is asleep in, they show her entire life. They were given as wedding presents when she married the speaker's father. And these are the sheets in which she gave birth to him. And now these are the sheets in which she's dying. He's quite literally incubating. She grows in his eyes. She opens and her, closes her eyes and she looks at him in her own way and we also understand why it's the mother because it goes back to his childhood when he asked about yet another sibling and she would say it was something the doctor brought in rather than something she gave birth to so now it's in a way she's the main character of the story she's finally reclaiming her position as the woman who gave birth to him as the woman of significance rather than just the doctor that he has always associated so he's understanding all the sacrifices that she has made for them and the semantic fields of rites of passage they mark the end of the poem, they create the unity of the end and the circle of life. Me at the bedside, incubating for real, again incubating, peering, appearing to her as she closes and opens her eyes, then lapses back, into a faraway smile whose precinct of vision I would enter every time, to assist and be asked in that hoarse and whisper of triumph. And what do you think of the new wee baby the doctor brought for us all when I was asleep? So these last bits by reinforcing the idea of incubation and fostering new life, they also raise questions about whether the mother is dying right now for real or whether he, she's just ill and he's visiting her. But also we see that their birth did not come easily. And although he now understands life as an adult, he does not understand death. And he's incubating and waiting to find out more about it. And the mother opens and she closes her eyes and she lapses into a faraway smile. So it's implied, again, it's implied again that she's on the liminality, that she's not quite here, that she's not quite present to lead him or to guide him through life. The mother would give credit to the doctor. The doctor brought while I was asleep. 
with a tr with a smile of triumph. So she was the true hero who delivered the baby, but she would just pretend that she was resting and doing nothing, whereas in reality she was doing all the work. And this could also link to gender roles and to giving the man the credit. So it, this could be compared to Chainsaw versus the Pampas Grass and other poems on the curriculum if you want to explore gender roles. And now, in turn, by realizing this, the poet is finally crediting his mother for giving him life, for for the artistic process, for the power of inspiration, he finally realizes who he should be grateful for. And in this way, the mother becomes the main character. The wee baby as well that the mother says, it's a sweet colloquial tone. It really shows how the mother didn't tell him the truth because she wanted to lie to him. She just wanted to give him comfort and nurture throughout her entire life. And it is only at the end that the speaker realizes this. And it is only at the end when he has grown up that he realizes that he was not a grown up but a child all this time, that he lacked this awareness. And now that he has it, this is it. The poem ends. We're, we're left uncertain about what to do next, about what to proceed. It's a very poignant work on the power of time and of remembrance and of your loved ones and of our origins. And I hope it prompts you into a bit of self-reflection. And this was actually the last poem on the edXL A-level English literature set curriculum that we had to cover. So I really hope that you enjoyed this journey. I left this poem for last because it was it was a difficult one emotionally and also analytically to analyze because the language may be simple, but there is so much more within each layer. So I hope you enjoyed this series. Just a reminder that if you're looking for these notes in PDF format, you can find them on my Buy Me A Coffee, where you can also buy me a coffee. Well, it's really, it's a book <laughs> to support me and my work. So thank you so much for watching and please do stick around and I'll see you soon.